All right. Hey, everyone. Um, I hope all of you are having a lovely day um, so far and that your holidays are going pretty well um, and that you've taken some time to, you know, enjoy them, but also um, get started on some exam revision. So, yeah, welcome to the 3-4 business management lecture for today. Um, so we'll be going through all of the year's content um, and sort of be exploring all of those different um, parts of this um, the course um, that we all covered um, this year. So we'll go through the structure later on, but just before I get into um, the lecture, um, just a bit about ATAR Notes, a bit of promo. Um, yeah, so ATAR Notes essentially creates a bunch of high school um, resources um, for students like you just to support um, you guys and we've been doing that for quite a long time um, to support you with your studies um, especially with VC three four subjects one two subjects all of those sort of things um, and so yeah there's a bunch of free resources we have an array of free resources as you can see on the screen um, there's study notes so there's hundreds um, that you can download there's a bunch of lectures um, sessions like these that um, we all hold um, to support you guys with your learning um, you know videos um, articles a bunch of um, resources to help and support you guys there and there's also a brand new website so you can definitely uh, check that out um, to explore um, all of those different things and then there's even other resources such as um, Chewsmart so we offer online tutoring um, from really experienced year 12 um, students who have achieved great success in their VCE um, also study guides, you might have heard about the ATAR Notes study guides. Um, there's, uh, those are some really good revision materials um, that a lot of students use to um, help get those higher marks. Um, definitely very useful as well as Ed Unlimited, which is an online platform which really gives you access to all of these guides all in one place, um, which is very handy. So it's sort of like a um, subscription that you pay um, and you get access to all of these resources there. All right, so yes, we are heading into um, the Business Management 3-4 lectures for today. Um, I'm Anandi and so just a bit about myself. Um, I graduated in 2021 and I got an ATAR of 96.25. I got a 44 in business management and also above 44 above 40 study score in health and human development further and also English and then I'm currently in my first year of studying commerce international at UNSW um, so that's been a great experience it's been very fun um, have learned a lot and definitely love what I'm doing so um, very much um, I'm very businessy um, but yeah, I'm also a very strong animal lover, and as you can see on my screen, that's my dog. His name is Prince, and he's an absolute menace, but nevertheless, he's a very big cutie, and I love him very much. Um, so, very strong animal lover, very strong dog lover, um, but yeah, that's a bit about me. Um, but I hope everyone is enjoying their school holidays. I think for most of you, this is probably your last week, so hopefully um, you're able to savor it <laughs> as it lasts, but um, I hope... Um, you all have gotten up to some interesting and exciting stuff. All right, so for today, this is the breakdown. There's going to be two content blocks. So in the first content block, that's going to run from 105 to 205. Um, so roughly an hour. And that, that's where we're going to cover all of the three areas of study under Unit 3. So Business Foundation, Managing Employees and Operation operations management um, those three areas of study and then we're going to have slido so probably answer some questions for around 10 minutes and then give you all a five minute break and then second content block which is all focusing on unit four as well as some exam preparation so we'll look at the first two area of areas of study under unit four so the need for implementing uh, the need for change and then also the second one which is implementing change as well as exam preparation um, which we'll focus on towards the end of the lecture and then we'll also i'll also answer some questions towards the end as well um, but just stressing that don't feel like you need to get everything written down these this recording 
will be available to you as well as um, the lecture slides. So all of that is uploaded onto the um, sort of site. Um, so don't feel like, don't feel stressed or overwhelmed that you have to like sort of get every single thing down. Um, you can always review the content and the slides um, at a later time as well. So um, I'll sort of be moving a little bit fast since we have so much to cover. We only have two and a half hours to cover um, the whole year's worth of content. Um, so I will try to cover everything. So there might I might be moving a little bit quickly. All right. So ask me any questions in the uh, using the poll section. So um, if you have any questions at any time, let me know. Um, just answer it. Just ask it in the um, poll section, and I'll be answering the most relevant questions. So do make sure that you're upvoting questions if you have sort of similar questions or you want, um, yeah, you want a specific question to be answered. Um, just always upvote it, and then um, I know that. I should be answering that question then. Okay, so um, I have my first Slido, which hopefully this works, but how do we all feel about today's lecture? Give everyone maybe a minute to vote on that. Cool. It's good to see that most people are ready to do some bizman. <clears throat> cool. <clears throat> Give everyone maybe like another 30 seconds to decide which how they're feeling about today's lecture. All right, cool. Nice to see that most people are ready to do some bizman. We have around 14% that are a bit confused, um, so no no stress we're here to go through everything so got you covered there um and then we have some people who are very excited they have lots of questions so that's even that's also good because um we'll get some time to answer those questions and address those concerns as well sweet all right let's get into the content for today then so like i sort of spoke to, uh spoke about before this is sort of the breakdown um for unit three unit four um the stuff that we're going to be covering sort of like a visual depiction um but yeah, the three areas studies under unit three and then also unit four as well. Um, so for the first content block, which we're currently in, um, we're going to be looking at unit three. So looking at the first area of study, business foundations, these are all of the key knowledge points that we're going to cover. So we're going to be looking, I'm not going to go through all of them individually, um, but you know, the types of businesses, objectives, sort of all of those um, things um, that you can see um, under the key knowledge area for the first area of study. All right, um, before I go on to types of business, I want to test you guys. Do you remember how many owners are in a partnership? Can we remember? Give everyone a minute to sort of recall how many owners are in a partnership. Another maybe 10 seconds to get in your answer. So do we think between two or 20 people, two or 10 people, no more than two, 10 max? What do we feel? Yes, okay, it's good to see that most people have put down between two to 20 people. That is the correct answer. So if we go and look at our types of business businesses, 
um, and the business, the different business structures that there are. So with Soul Trader, they're owned, that's a business structure that's owned by a single individual. So there's only one owner. They have unlimited liability. With partnership, owned by two to 20 people. So remember two to 20, not two to 10. Um, tried to trick you there. But yeah, two to 20 people. Again, unlimited liability. Um, I'm going to test you guys on unlimited liability, see if you remember, but we'll also go through the concept there as well. Um, and then private limited company, one to 50 shareholders, they have limited liability and then also perpetuity. So that's <clears throat> with perpetuity, that just means that in the case where the owners or the directors sort of leave the company or um, the actual owners sort of pass away, the company is um, still able to exist and can continue existing despite um, sort of the original owners um, leaving or sort of um, passing away. Um, so that sort of um, that sort of links to the idea of perpetuity. With private limited company, also note that the even though they have shareholders, those shareholders are only approved and selected by sort of the, the directors of the business. Um, so therefore, it's not listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. With public listed companies. They have above 50 shareholders. Again, they have limited liability, also have perpetuity. And the difference here is that shares are available to the public and therefore they're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. With our social enterprise, profits are distributed towards a community cause. And just be careful in the way that you describe social enterprise. Don't say that they're distributed just towards the community. Be specific by saying that it's towards a community cause. So it's not just to the community in general, it's sort of like an issue, a problem um, within the community and sort of a social enterprise exists to support and alle alleviate and address those sort of um, issues and um, problems within the community. So therefore um, their profits are sort of directed towards that community cause. Government business enterprise. So the profits are returned to the government um, so sort of the owner is the government um, and the main objective is to provide a service. So um, if you guys can think of some government business enterprise, so some good examples would be, you know, Australian Post, Vic Roads, they all exist to provide an essential service. Um, so those are sort of good examples of government business enterprises. All right, another Slido, another question for you guys. So what is unlimited liability? Can we remember? So give you all maybe a minute or two to have a go at answering that. Give everyone maybe 30 seconds to finish answering the question. So do we think that the owner is responsible for all debts of the business? So personal assets can be seized or are shareholders personally liable? Or is it where the owner gets to keep all profits? Or is it where the business ceases to exist? All right. Yes. So. It is the first one. So unlimited liability, that is where the personal is, the owner is responsible for all the debts of the business, um, which means that, so in the case that the business falls into debt, that is when um, the, owners, uh, the owner's actual personal assets can be seized in order to compensate um, and to um, sort of, you know, yeah, compensate for the debt that has been incurred by the business. So um, that's essentially the idea of unlimited liability, but we'll also go through that um, later as well. Um, with limited liability, that's the opposite. That is where um, shareholders are sort of personally, shareholders are only held accountable to the amount of sort of shares that they own in the business. So the directors are not accountable. It's only like shareholders which sort of lose the money or the percentage that they've sort of invested in that business. All right, another Slido question. So we have our different management styles. Before I go through the management styles, can we remember which management styles have centralized decision-making power? So 
Plato? Is it autocratic, persuasive, and consultative? Or is it autocratic and participative? Or is it participative, persuasive, and consultative? Or is it only autocratic? So I'll give you guys a clue. So centralized decision-making power is when the manager um, has the decision, like makes the ultimate decision. So has the final say um, and is ultimately the one making decisions. Give everyone maybe another minute to have a go at answering this question before I go through the different management styles. Okay, I think everyone's had a go at answering it. All right, so yes, let's go through the different management styles. So as you can see, the correct answer is autocratic, persuasive, and consultative, because ultimately with all of those three management styles, the manager is the one making that final decision. So let's go through them individually. So with autocratic, that is where communication is exclusively downwards, and the manager makes all the decisions with no feedback. So it's literally the manager who's making um, the decisions that he, they're not sort of consulting anyone, any in employees, not asking for the inputs or anything. They're just making the decision um, and sticking with that. Therefore, the direction of communication is one way downwards. So they're just um, sort of, you know, just making the decision, telling it, telling that decision to employees. Um, there's nothing sort of, there's no sort of inputs that are sort of being sought in that sense. Then the decision-making power centralized since they're making the ultimate decision. With persuasive, this is where the management um, makes the decision, so centralized, and then they're gonna take that extra step to sort of sell or explain the reasons of the decision or actually justify the decision to employees. So the manager is making the decision, but then they're sort of justifying that decision to their employees. So they're saying, you know, you have to do train. You have to undergo training because, um, you know, you have to increase your knowledge around how to around this particular software. So, sort of justifying why they have to undergo training, as an example, um, and therefore direction of communication is still one way, um, since they're sort of, um, sort of justifying and making that decision as well, and therefore the decision making power is centralized as well. Consultative. This is where employees' ideas and opinions are considered before decisions are made, but Again, the final decision is still made by the manager. So this is slightly different to the first two because now the manager is sort of seeking and um, sort of acknowledging the ideas and opinions of its employees before they're actually making um, their decision. Um, so therefore, the direction of communication is two-way because there would there is that sort of communication between um, the manager but also employees since their ideas and opinions are also being considered. And then decision-making power is still centralized because ultimately the manager is the one making the decision. Then we have our participative management style. Definition is that, you know, decision-making is shared between the manager and employee. Both parties are sort of engaging in that two-way communication. So now decision-making power is shared. So both the manager and employee have um, decision-making power and therefore it's decentralized since they both have um, that ability to make decisions and also two-way communication since um, you know they both sort of have that decision making power so they're both sort of going to communicate with one another um, and therefore there's sort of two ways um, that communication is going in and then we have lays fail and this is where decisions are completely left to the group managers give up all decision making responsibility so therefore again um, Decision making again is sort of decentralized. Everyone sort of makes the decisions together. Um, there's no sort of one person making the decisions. And direction of communication is sort of always it's between everyone. Um, and so yeah. So just a bit of a summary: autocratic manages the one making the decision. Persuasive manager making decision but justifying the decision. Consultative manager sort of 
considering the ideas of employees, but ultimately making the decision participative, um, both manager and employees can make the decision laser fair everyone. So, um, so decisions are left completely to the group. Um, yeah. Okay. So management styles, looking at the appropriateness, appropriateness of management styles in relation to these four aspects. So when in the exam, you could be presented with a case study, um, and you might be asked to, you know, sort of identify and justify which, um, why a particular manager should use a specific management style. And so when you're talking about a management style, you when you're justifying it, you would want to talk about these sort of four aspects. Um, so depending on the management style, um, you know, that could relate to the nature of the task. So, you know, is it a classified or open task? Is it an unpopular but necessary decision? Also thinking, thinking about the time that... Um, is sort of given so is it a quick decision that needs to be made or is there a lot of available time um even the manager preference so is are they a good decision maker are they a good leader so looking at the actual like skills of the manager themselves and also the experience of employees so are employees actually experienced or not experienced so in the case where um, employees are not experienced maybe using a consultative management style wouldn't be the best option because with the consultative style we know that um input the manager considers the inputs of employees and therefore if employees don't don't have um you know that experience they might not be able to offer credible or valuable inputs and maybe that might lead to a wrong decision being made so just sort of thinking about those aspects even with time so if a quick decision is required maybe the manager would want to think about using an autocratic management style because autocratic management style is just them making the decision on their own and then sort of that's sort of the end of it. Um, they don't spend a lot of time sort of consulting other people or justifying themselves to other people. And so that sort of saves on a lot of time. So yeah, thinking about those different things. All right, so question for you guys. You're a manager of a VCE tutoring center and you've just hired 10 new tutors with no experience working at your center. Which management style would you implement for the first month that these tutors are working? So um just think about which one you would use. So would you use the autocratic management, persuasive or participative management style? So you can just think it, um, give you guys like 30 seconds just to choose one, which one you would think about using. Okay, hopefully you all have thought of something, but we wouldn't go with the participative management since that involves employees making decisions and that's not a great idea if those employees are new and inexperienced. It's sort of like the idea that I touched on just before that if employees don't necessarily have the experience or the qualifications or the skills or the knowledge um, to make, you know, um, knowledgeable decisions, then that might not be a great idea since um, that might lead to the incorrect decision being made. Autocratic, um, def you wouldn't use autocratic. The edge persuasive has over autocratic in the decision is in this situation is because managers are able to explain the reasons for their decisions, and that means that the new employees can learn how the business works. Also, with persuasive, um, since the manager is actually justifying their decision, it can also like. Um, not be as detrimental on the relationship between the manager and employees because if you think about autocratic management the manager is making the decision and therefore they're sort of just telling employees what to do and as an employee you might feel bossed around or um, you might not necessarily um, 
feel happy. And so at least with persuasive, um, you feel, you see the reasons as to what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and so that sort of helps with that relationship as well. Um, cool. All right. Management skills. So we have a slider question for this. What are some, no, not that one. This. Uh, okay. Just going back to the slider question, I think it just. Okay, just have a think about the different management skills. And hopefully this works. I can get the slider back up. But have a think about the different management skills that we, um, that you, that there are in the study design. Okay, yep, this should be the slider up on there now. What are some examples of management skills listed in the study design? So do we have communication, active listening and support? Or is it delegation and support? Or is it delegation and optimism? Or is it planning, leading, and decision making? What do we think? So give everyone maybe two minutes to have a go at answering this before we go into management skills. Maybe 30 more seconds before we go through the answer. All right, I think everyone's had a go at answering that. Yes, good. Planning, leading, and decision making. So these are our six management skills. So we have communication. So communication is really about the transfer of information between one person to another person. And with communication, it's really important to think about that the way in which the manager is using communication as a skill. So really important that communication is articulate, concise, and clear. Um, and so, you know, whether that be verbal communication or nonverbal communication, you know, writing emails or um, you know, through letters or verbal communication through like speech and dialogue. It's really important that the way in which managers are using this as a skill is very clear so that employees understand what they're doing. Then we have delegation. This is the process of handing down tasks and responsibility to subord subordinates. Um, so yeah, really just um, manage management, just handing down other tasks to subordinates or other employees. Um, and so that that sort of encompasses delegation as a management skill. And then we have decision making, and this is really the ability to sort of create alternative solutions to a problem. So really understand what are the alternatives, what are the possibilities, um, possible solutions to a specific problem, and then choosing the one that's the most appropriate, the one that's the most effective um, out of all of those alternatives. And then we have planning which involves sort of deciding in advance the steps an organization will take to achieve an objective. So really just ensuring that the organization is well prepared um, and has preemptive sort of steps in place and has a, sort of a plan in place so that um, they have a clear direction as to how they're going to achieve what they want to achieve. Then we have leading, which is all about influencing and motivating staff to achieve organizational objectives. This kind of links to unit four, um, I think area study one where you learned about like the importance of leadership during change management. This is sort of the same things you would be talking about here. So really looking at influencing, motivating staff, being a figure of support um, so that organizational objectives can be achieved. And then we have our interpersonal skills. This is really the ability to relate and emphasize 
empathize, sorry, with others and build effective relationships. So now looking at how um, the manager can actually build meaningful and positive relationships with its employees, that's all done through interpersonal skills. So really empathizing with them, understanding them, understanding where they're coming from, um, that sort of ways that the manager will use interpersonal skills um, as management skill. All right, so why is communication important for a business? So employees need clear information about what is expected of them um, in order to perform their tasks correctly. So if communication is clear, employees understand what is expected of them and so they're able to um, complete their job, their duties, their roles um, correctly. And so there's no sort of mistakes being made. Good communication also helps with building, you know, strong relationships with employees, which can help improve corporate culture. So um, that's definitely a key part of the impact it has on relationships. So if employees understand, you know, um, what's expected of them, they're not making mistakes, you know, they're able to perform the tasks um, better, um, they might be more productive, and therefore that supports um, and promotes more stronger relationships with management. And then also two-way communication allows for both managers and employees to receive feedback on their ideas or performance um, and so allows both parties to sort of understand where they can improve. Cool. Then we have corporate culture. This is the shared set of beliefs, values and attitudes by those within the business. Um, and so really important with corporate culture that you're highlighting um, that it's a shared set of beliefs and values um, that is sort of within that is held by those people within the business so can we remember what is um official corporate culture so real corporate culture is the actual and established shared set of values beliefs and attitudes within an organization as reflected by workplace behaviors such as you know the celebration of rituals or even events but it's really with real corporate culture, it can only be experienced by those who have actually had contact with the business. So, for example, actual employees that have actually worked within that business, they would have experienced the real corporate culture because that's all to do with, you know, the actual attitudes of the organization, the workplace behaviors, um, but also the internal events that go on. So the celebration of rituals, the celebration of events, all of those things. Can you guys remember what official corporate culture is? So I'll put up a slide over for that one as well. So with official corporate culture, do we think that it's culture that it that is experienced by experienced through contact or employment within the business? Or is it values and beliefs of a business which is presented to the public through written statements? What do we think? Wait, did I have I closed that? Okay, hopefully it works now. All right, yes, so it is definitely the first one. So it is, if I go back, yeah, it's a, basically official corporate culture. Um, it's stated and documented, um, outlined, I, it, it's the stated and documented outline of the beliefs, values, and attitudes um, of an organization. And that's often reflected through, you know, the, the business's mission and vision statement. So it's really what's seen to the public and what we see as a public. Um, by the business and so we often see you know their slogans their mission their vision statements and that's sort of the culture that we um sort of are presented with so yeah that's official versus real corporate culture um so what are some ways that management could influence and develop a desired culture at an organization so there's different things that management can do so they could maybe implement a dress code have rituals um you know provide them training um all of those things 
even reinforce their desired culture through meetings. So reminding the um, employees around their values um, within every meeting. Um, those are some examples that you could talk about. All right, we've done area study one. So just some key things to remember with area study ones, area of study one um, with Soul Trader. Really important that you include the word owned in your definition. So it's a um, business structure, which is owned by an individual partnership. Important that you specifically say it's owned by two to 20 people. And again, using the word owned social enterprise, you know, saying that it's um, the profits go toward it, towards a community cause, not the community. So something that I sort of emphasized before. And then corporate culture, important to include that it's a shared set of beliefs, values and attitudes within the business. And then with stakeholder, um, people often tend to mix mix up stakeholder and shareholders. So really important, make sure that you don't mix up the definitions or don't get confused with those two um, terms. So a stakeholder is someone that is vested, has a vested interest in the business, whereas a shareholder, <clears throat> um, important to actually define it in detail. So it's not just someone who owns a share of the business, but, you know, they have, um, you know, they've invested in the business, they expect um, dividends, they have all of these expectations. So sort of alluding to those different aspects as well. All right, so <clears throat> then we have area study two of unit three. Um, and these are the different things that we'll go over under this area of study. So looking at the key skills in the study design for this one, important to just think, think about your um, key skills. So remember, you need to discuss and evaluate business information and ideas. So really anything in the area study could be theor theoretically um, be discussed or evaluated. So be prepared to do so. So with your discuss and evaluate questions, um, important that you're talking about advantages and disadvantages. So with evaluate, though, you're going to include that final opinion at the end of your answer. So keeping that in mind and then compare and evaluate that's sort of referring to motivation strategies and then the different training options as well. And then also remember that you bring a contemporary case study example with you to the exam. So you don't wanna be making one on the spot, make sure that you've sort of researched one thoroughly and have one in your mind that you can use in the case that, you know, a question asks you to use a contemporary case example. All right, and you should be able to also propose and justify um, as well so that could be referring to anything um i think in last year it was 2019 it was towards awards and agreements um but yeah some key task words sort of the standard things that you you all have been working on throughout the whole year all right so managing employees and objectives so with the effective management of employees <clears throat> that means that employees are more likely to be motivated and therefore that's going to impact you know staff turnover but also help increase employee productivity and efficiency. So if employees are, um, you know, if the business has less of a staff turnover and employees are able to work a lot more productively, that's going to mean there's going to be less cost for the business um, and therefore it's going to be more profit. On the other hand, effective management of employees can also lead to well-trained and effective employees. So maybe training is implemented. That means employees are well-trained. They have the skills, they have the knowledge, um, they're aware of how to complete their jobs. And therefore, they're going to be a lot more productive and efficient. And outputs are also of high quality. They're not making mistakes. Um, and then also, if outputs are of high quality, meets those outputs meet customer expectations. Therefore, customers are more likely to be satisfied. And therefore, that's going to impact business reputation. But if customers are satisfied, they're more likely to come back to the business, keep buying from the business, meaning that there's more sales, more revenue, and therefore, more market share. And then if there's more sales, also more profit. Cool. And then we have our motivation theories. So we have learned about the three motivation theories. So with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is where human needs are arranged on a hierarchy. So um, they have to be completed in a sequential order. And so it is the unsatisfied need above a person in the hierarchy that it is, that is the source of motivation. So um, you can't just um, try and satisfy your sort of self-actualization needs um, at the top of the hierarchy, you have to, you know, complete them all in sequential order. So just ensuring that, you know, the business 
understands that. That's a key principle of this theory. Um, so it's important that um, you mention that in your answer when you're talking about this motivation theory. And then we have Locke and Latham's goal setting theory. And this is where motivation is derived from setting and attaining goals. Um, and within this theory, goals must be challenging, set jointly, specific, monitored, and also given feedback. So really important that those different aspects are considered um, when making goals. And then we have Lawrence and Horia's for drive theory. This is where motivation is derived from four basic needs to the act to drive people. And so the four drives under this theory include a drive to acquire, bond, learn, and defend. And remember that the drive to defend is a latent drive. And so that's only activated when there's, actually, when, when there's an actual threat in the workplace. All right, so looking more closely at Lawrence and Nahoria's four drive theory, this essentially proposes that individuals are motivated to achieve four basic needs known as the drives, and therefore the drives must be set, um, must be met, sorry, simultaneously. And so these are the four drives that we went through um, and sort of some strategies that it, the HR manager could sort of use to develop these drives. So when targeting the drive to acquire, so they might, you know, reward individual employees with praise, recognition, and some interesting assignments, um, really, you know, motiv uh, I think, yeah, motiva motivating the employees, um, and sort of stimulating them mentally in order to um, achieve those things. And then also it could be done through a reward system linked to performance. So maybe career advancement, performance related pay, those sort of address an employee's drive to acquire. The drive to bond, so encouraging teamwork, setting collaborative, collaborative tasks, events and rituals, and also the business ensuring that they're maintaining a culture of team spirit, openness and pride. So really creating opportunities for employees to really connect with each other, um, learn, learn from each other, but also, yeah, build relationships with each other, which is um, all about satisfying their drive to bond. And then we have the drive to learn. So this could mean that um, tasks are, you know, interesting challenging so that they stimulate employees. So, you know, they're not just easy so that the employee isn't really um, challenged in any way. So if the employee is challenged, there's a lot more opportunity for them to learn more about a particular thing, a particular subject. Um, so that's definitely addressing the drive to learn and even offering training opportunities. So opportunities where the business, where the employee can continue upskilling themselves, um, learning more about a particular area so that um, they're learning more and able to complete the job a lot more effectively. And then the drive to defend. So ensuring that there's a supportive workplace, implementing policies for dispute resolution, um, but even using a participative management style. So using open communication, decentralized decision-making, all of those different things um, for that. Okay, and then we have performance management. So we have management by objectives. So this is all about a participative setting where a manager and employee sort of jointly set, jointly determine a set of employee objectives and goals. So really um, jointly the, the employee and the manager working together so that um, they can come up with sort of objectives and goals for the employee. And so how this works is that at the end of the review period, um, the performance is measured against these established objectives. So once um, the performance, once, once the um, at the end of the review period, the employee will sort of come back to the manager. They'll sort of reassess those objectives, see how well um, the employee has progressed um, to see um, their performance in that area. And then those goals should follow the same five principles as described by the Locke and Latham goal setting theory. So ensuring that it's challenging um, and, you know, there's some feedback, all of those different parts, you know, there's task complexity, all of that. And then we have performance appraisal. So this is sort of the process used to measure an individual's performance over a period of time. So there's a set period of time and really looking at how the individual has been able to perform over that period of time. And so the manager, which is the appraiser, um, and the employee, which is the appraisee, sort of then come together to discuss the employee's performance over that period of time. And then so it's sort of with performance appraisals, it tends to follow these three steps. So the first one really determining what aspects of performance um, that need to be measured. Second step, actually evaluating that performance. 
And then the third one, sort of reviewing the performance, providing feedback to the employee so that they can sort of understand their strengths, but also understand, you know, where are sort of areas where they can actually improve upon um, and then address those accordingly. And then we have self-evaluation. This is more of an individual performance management strategy. So this is where an employee actually assesses and rates their own performance in a number of areas. And they might rate themselves in different areas um, and compare those ratings to a rating completed by a manager. And maybe if there's differences, sort of addressing those. But yeah, it's really when an employee is sort of rating themselves against how they feel about their own performance. And then we have our employee observation. So employee observation really involves the collection of feedback relating to an employee's performance from other stakeholders. And so examples of employee observations could be 360 feedback, secret shoppers, or recordings of phone conversations. But with mystery shoppers, that's maybe um, where a, another stakeholder sort of observes an employee um, while on work without them knowing and so that is sort of an example of, of employee observation that's probably a good example to use in your answer when you're talking about mystery shoppers um, as employee observations cool and then we have our termination management strategy so there were there were four um, with resignation this is essentially where um, an employee leaves the workplace usually to go to another job. So they, you know, resign. Um, that might be due to getting another, a better job opportunity or, you know, they might not actually like the current workplace that they work at, but this is where the employee is actually voluntarily leaving the business. Um, yeah. And then we have retirement. So this is when an employee decides to leave the paid workforce. And so um, most often, they're leaving permanently, but again, this is them voluntarily often making that decision that they want to retire, and so they completely altogether leave that paid workforce. Redundancy, this is the termination of employment by an employer because the employee no, employer no longer needs that particular job to be done, and therefore that job no longer exists. So this is involuntary, so this is when the employer actually um, sort of, the 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 job role ex itself no longer is, exists and therefore the employee um, is sort of let off um, and made redundant due to that. And then we have dismissal and this is termination due to incompetence or indis indiscipline. Um, again, it is involuntary. <clears throat> and we also need to think about the entitlements. So which forms of termination would involve a redundancy package? So with redundancy, it would just, for the redundancy package, it would just be redundancy. So under redundancy, an employee who is made redundant, they're entitled to receive a redundancy package. How about notice of termination? So it would be all of them, but dismissal. Um, so with resignation, retirement, redundancy, all of them are entitled to a notice of termination. So both for the employee, but also the employer. So if the employee is deciding to resign um, or retire, they would have to ensure that they're giving the notice of termination to their employer. How about payment of accrued long service leave? That would be all of them. So the payment of accrued long service leave um, applies to all of resignation, retirement, redundancy, and dismissal. Um, so as long as the employee has worked at the business for more than seven years. So if they've worked for more than seven years, they're entitled to that, pay that payment. All right, let's look at the participants in the workplace. So we have HR managers. So they're really looking at um, bridging that communication between employers and employees. And they're sort of the primary people who deal with any disputes that arise within um, that workplace. So between employees or employees. So if employees tend to have any issues within the workplace, they go to HR and they sort of deal with those issues. Um, but they also do some other things. So, you know, for example, being up to date with awards, um, ensuring that, um, you know, those legal requirements um, relating to employees are sort of kept, kept on track and kept up to date. Employees, they prioritize themselves in negotiations with management. So they take industrial action if necessary. 
employee associations. They represent employers in the collective bargaining process. They advise employers on their rights and responsibilities and also lobby to government in support of employers. We have also, we also have unions. They essentially represent the interests of employees in a particular industry. And so therefore they're gonna be negotiating wages for their, for their members during collective bargaining process. Um, but also they're responsible for um, organizing and authorize, author, 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 organizing and getting their industrial action author, authorized by the Fair Work Commission. I could not say that word for some reason, but um, anyways, we provide, they also provide support and advice to members about workers' rights. Um, so in the case that employees want to know their rights, they will sort of look um, towards their unions and the unions will provide a bunch of information about that. And then we also have the Fair Work Commission and they're responsible for creating awards, approving agreements, approving um, industrial action, um, but also being arbitra arbitrators or medi mediators um, in workplace disputes. All right, so then we have our three methods of dispute resolution. So we have grievance procedure. This is where there are formal steps set up by a human resource manager that enable a structure for resolution of an industrial dispute. So often the grievance procedure can be found in the employee contract. So in the case that employees have some sort of issue within the workplace, there's sort of those steps, um, which is the grievance procedure, which they can follow um, to address that. So in the case that, you know, one step doesn't work, it sort of escalates to another level and then it slowly escalates from there. So maybe the first, first method is, you know, telling it to a manager if it doesn't if it's not um, solved there, then they might take it to the HR manager. And if it's not solved there, then maybe the directors or the CEO of the board, if it's not solved there, then it might escalate to um, getting a mediator, going to mediation or um, arbitration. So maybe involving the Fair Work Commission. So as I sort of discussed, so the first step might be the employee and the supervisor discuss the issue. And then maybe if that doesn't work, the employee and their representative meet with the senior manager and HR manager. Um, and then if those two don't, don't work, then often um, they often look to mediation or arbitration. And then just a note, mediation and arbitration were a distinguished question, distinguished between question in the 2017 VICA exam. So um, you could be asked about um, dispute resolution in this week, in this year's exam. All right, and then mediation. So mediation is a formal method of dispute resolution. Um, where an independent third party sort of facilitates the discussion between the disputing parties, which tend to be the employer and the employee, um, so that they come to their own resolution. But just note, with mediation, um, that third party isn't making the decision as to who's right. They're non-biased and they're sort of just facilitating discussion. They're just there to um, be a figure so that both parties can um, sort of communicate their sides of the story in an orderly manner. And then we have arbitration. So this is a method of dispute resolution where both parties put their cases forward to an independent third party who then makes the final legally binding decision. And that often tends to be the Fair Work Commission. Um, they have the power to make those legally binding decisions. Um, but this is sort of, and this involves the court. Um, and that's sort of when um, legal consequences and legal decisions are being made. All right, then we have our, the third area of study under unit three, operations management. Let us go. So first dot point is looking at the key elements of the operation system. So if we look at a cafe's operations, what are some inputs that, what are some inputs for a cafe to make coffee? So this is also a Slido question. So I will put up the poll. So think about what are some inputs for a cafe to make coffee? What would some inputs involve? Give everyone maybe like a minute or two to think about that.
Yep. So when you're thinking about inputs, don't try to think about like, it doesn't just involve ingredients. Try to think about other aspects. So inputs is literally everything that's needed in order for the cafe to make coffee. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. We've got some great answers in there and most of these are correct. So yep. We need the coffee grounds, we need coffee beans, we need the actual shop itself, so the actual building. We need sugar, um, labor, so employees, capital. So can we be more specific with capital? Maybe the actual like um, machine to make the coffee. So we need supplies. What kind of supplies though? Um, milk, yes. Yes, so we need... Um, cups the actual cups even just thinking about the time so time to make the actual coffee itself um yeah some straws the grinder electricity the power mm -hmm. yeah so most of these are really good so just remember when you're talking about inputs try to be as specific as possible so don't try to be general um so don't just say um like supplies. So tell me what kind of supplies. Um, so just try to be as specific as possible. But yeah, we need the workers. Most of you guys identified this, so that was great. Um, machines, the milk, um, the actual like coffee beans, or if it's chocolate, um, depending on what sort of coffee that they're making, but even time. All right, let's think about the processes. So what would be, what are the processes for the cafe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of these are pretty good. So, you know, grounding the coffee, warming the milk, the pouring, um, packaging, not sure about packaging. Do we package the coffee? Um, so maybe thinking about, yep, steaming the milk, the coffee art, actually pouring the coffee into the cups, mixing, grinding, heating, cooling. So this is in relation to actually making the coffee. So... Yep. So yeah, all of these, most of these are pretty good. Um, so that's great to see. So yeah, actually making the coffee. So the processes is how um, we, the business actually uses inputs to create its final outputs. So it's really looking at making the coffee. So that might be, you know, steaming the milk, um, grounding the beans, pouring the, pouring the coffee into the cup, maybe the coffee art, whatever it might be. Um, and then the output is that final coffee. So really important with processes that you're linking how you're using your inputs in relation to, you know, creating your final output. So being specific to how they're actually making the coffee would be the correct answer. All right, and then looking at key elements of a flight center store. So if we look at the inputs, so that's the physical building itself, and then the employees, um, the actual technology, so the machinery, maybe even like the F-Force machines to process transactions, um, light, electricity, all of those things. Processes would involve actually delivering the holiday information, so actually answering the questions of customers, um, and if they have a question around, you know, a particular country or a particular, um, you know, they would want information on a particular um, subject, you know, actually answering those, addressing those concerns. And then the output is just the holiday information, for example, if it was that. Cool. Um, and then this is just a note from the VCA 2018 examiner's report. It seemed that some students believe that in a service business processes and outputs were the same thing, but that is incorrect. So 
just remember that, yeah, with processes, it's how you're using your inputs to create your final output. So for example, if it was a bank, um, the processes would be maybe if a customer came up to an employee and they asked to set up a bank account or they asked some information on like home loans or something like that, the processes would be, um, you know, helping them to actually, you know, establish a bank account on the system. So getting their personal details, getting all their contact info, all of those things. And then the output is actually creating a bank account and, you know, satisfying that customer. Cool. Looking at manufacturing and service businesses. So another slido on that, but what is a correct man characteristic of a manufacturing business? So there's three possible options. What do we think is the correct one? So are goods tangible or are processes very labor intensive rather than capital intensive? Or is the output not homogenous or standardized? So that should be one correct answer. Give you all 30 seconds. Yes, I think most of you guys have got the right answer. So we'll go through the characteristics of manufacturing businesses. Um, but yeah, goods are tangible and that means that they can be stored, touched and held. So if we look at the different characteristics, so with a manufacturer, they produce goods that are tangible, which means they can be stored, touched and held. Um, but also their outputs tend to be quite homogenous. So if you think about Yakult, um, all of their outputs, you know, tend to be homogenous. Um, so they have that, you know, homogenous output. Also involves minimal final customer contact. So it's really about, um, you know, for example, with the Yakult example, they um, produce the output, they produce the Yakult, and then they distribute they distribute it to all of, you know, Coles or Woolies, wherever um, they sell the Yakult. But there's sort of minimal customer contact um, with that output because customers then just go to Coles and then they just buy the product. Um, compared to service business, there's a high degree of final customer contact because, um, you know, it's a little service that you're providing. So with the bank, you're, you know, engaging with the customer, you're understanding what their needs are, you're even during the process stage, you know, you're working with the customer to, you know, get the information. Um, so there's quite a lot of customer contact there. Um, and also with service business, their goods are intangible. So it's not, it can't be stored or, or um, held. And so um, therefore they are very much tailored and customized to the cut to the um, customer's need. So if you think about the bank, all kinds of customers walk into the bank and everyone has different concerns. And so the output that is being made in an, in a service organization will be quite different depending on what the customer is asking um, for in the business. And then also with manufacturers, so they're generally produced and very much cap capital intensive. So especially during the process stage, there's a lot of capital being used. So um, if you think about the coffee machines, the cafe examples, so the coffee machines, um, there's, you know, the actual, yeah, the way that you grind the beans, a lot of capital being used, but even with Yakult, so they have a whole manufacturing plant, um, you know, automated production line. So there's a lot of capital, a lot of machinery being used, whereas with the service, service organization, um, it's a lot more labor intensive. Okay. And then also production and consumption are, se are separate, whereas with service organization, production and consumption happen at the same time. So with the bank example, while um, during the pr process stage, the the employer is helping the customer addressing their needs, whatever, if they want to set up sort of a bank account, um, depending on what they want. Um, but at the same time, the customer is receiving that information. And so it's sort of happening simultaneously, whereas with a manufacturer, that tends to happen, be separate. Okay, I'm going to whiz through um, these strategies. So we have four areas where the business can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the operations. So 
we have technological developments, materials, quality, and waste minimization. So with technological developments, we have CAD, computer-aided design, and so this is essentially a computer software that streamlines and aids in both the creation of product designs and the testing of modified product designs as well. So with CAD, um, advantages tend to be that it really helps to increase the design accuracy, so therefore more effectiveness. It, help, it decreases time required for design, so more efficiency, identification of errors before they occur in the production, so reducing waste and increasing efficiency. And then with disadvantages, it tends to be quite expensive, so there might be some high setup costs, but that might, you know, due to the high setup costs, that might mean there's sort of low profits in the short term. Um, but because it is a software, um, that might be a little bit expensive for the business. And then employees also need to be trained around how to use the software. So there might be some training expenses, um, but also training cost time. So there isn't those immediate um, results. All right, then we have CAM and computer aided manufacturing. That is basically involving the automated involves the automated control of the production process. So really looking at how, um, looking at machinery, tools and equipment by computer. So how machinery is sort of, you know, programmed in a particular way um, and sort of the equipment used there. Advantages for CAM is that it is very flexible, responsive to customized demands. Um, so as new orders come in, the computer can, you know, really adapt to them um, and sort of execute it accordingly. Um, also helps increase the speed of production, so improving productivity, and then also reduces labor and requirements and associated costs, such as break time and all of that. Cool. And then disadvantages, so it might have high setup costs as well, since it is essentially machinery that you're implementing into the business, um, and so that could limit short-term profitability, um, and then an error in CAM's functioning could even result in the whole entire production process being halted, severely reducing the business's productivity. Um, but for example, with CAM, if you think about Yakult, um, with the, because Yakult was the case study that we looked at, um, that I looked at in year 12. Um, and so with the machinery, you know, CAM could involve that, CAM could, it, it's the way that they program. So when they're filling up the Yakult liquid, so they're programmed to maybe, you know, fill it up to, I don't know, like, five centimeters or something like that. Um, but you have to keep in mind that, you know, with the last stop point, if there's any, any error that could impact defects, it could, you know, impact the production process. And so um, it, they could be, it could cause delays in that aspect. Okay, and then we have materials management. And so we have the mass production schedule. This is essentially where um, production requirements are set out. And so things that they, it's going to set out is like what what needs to be produced, how much of an item needs to be produced, when items are going to be produced by and how the items are going to be produced. And then materials requirement planning, this is more so planning a planning process that supports the master production schedule by setting out more so the exact requirements of materials um, of the business's operating system as well as, you know, supplier lead in time. So it's more so how the materials are going to be sourced and like the exact material requirements. Advantages is that this ensures that there's enough product to meet and de meet demand, reducing customer dissatisfaction rates. Um, also reduces waste associated with inventory that is not used in production. And then disadvantages is that there needs to be high level communication, both with the business and to customers and suppliers, um, but that not might not necessarily be the strength of all businesses. Okay, then we have our quality strategies. So quality control, this really looks at checking products and services over the production stages to ensure that they meet benchmarks or predetermined standards of quality. But essentially, the steps of quality control is the first step is establishing those benchmarks. Second one is to actually inspect the output. Third one, third step is to compare um, the inspection results of the output to the benchmarks and see if those, if the output quality meets the benchmarks. Um, and if in the case that that quality standards are not met, then the business needs to make sure that they're taking corrective action to fix that. And then we have quality assurance. This is where the certification is awarded to a business by an independent third party um, once they've achieved a specific level of quality um, in their production, in their in the production of their goods or services. So upon if they have met that level of quality, they're going to be awarded a cert cert certification. And so um, 
that certification basically proves that the business meets its established standards of the third party. Um, and this is a proactive process, unlike quality control, which is reactive. So quality assurance is the business actually ensuring that, you know, they have the systems in place to ensure that um, that level of quality is put in place. Whereas the quality control, it's reactive because they just have benchmarks, they're comparing the output results to the benchmarks. And then um, if they find that the output doesn't meet, meet those benchmarks, then they're taking corrective action. Um, so that's sort of why it's reactive. TQM, so this is a holistic quality management approach um, and it really looks at achieving continuous improvement of production processes, um, goods and services through really involving everyone in the organization and the three principles within TQM. So continuous improvement, so ensuring that every stage of production is bettered, so you know constantly improving. Second one is this customer focus, so ensuring that the process provides customer with what it aligns with um, and sort of meets their needs, wants and expectations, but also there's worker participation. So linking to the idea that everyone needs to be involved. Um, so really, you know, that workers are contributing their ideas. They have opportunities to say what they think um, and are consulted for the ideas on improvement. Okay. And then we have global considerations and operations management. Um, we have these four things. So with global sourcing of output, uh, global sourcing of inputs, this is when a business imports the resources that they require for the production process from an overseas um, non-Australian organization. Um, and they take advantage of comparative advantages. So um, cheaper labor costs and economies of scale. So a business might use um, this might import from a overseas organization, you know, to take advantage of labor, cheaper labor costs. Um, but then it's also it tends to be, it could be quite costly because there might be some hidden, um, costs such as, you know, taxes, tariffs, exchange rates, things like that. Um, there could also be some CSR risks. So if they outsource, um, their inputs, maybe that business, um, doesn't operate ethically and that might impact their sort of reputation. Um, but also there's a loss of control and, also the loss of Australian jobs as well, since they're importing from a organ non-Australian organization. And then we have overseas manufacturing. This is when the entire production process occurs overseas. And again, take, it takes advantage of comparative advantages, so cheaper labor costs, economies of scale, and then the same sort of disadvantages that there could be some CSR risks, um, there's a loss, there could be a loss of control, but also um, Australian jobs as well. And then we have outsourcing. So this is when a business sort of outsources um, a non-core related business function. So that might be website development, it might be marketing, um, but it's non-core to the business. Um, for example, a lot of businesses outsource their sort of telecommunications. Um, so that's sort of an example of an outsourced function. Um, but this takes advantage of better expertise and comparative advantages. So maybe a country is really good at um, software development or um, you know, a particular area. And so they're, they're outsourcing it to that country, um, a business in that country because of their better skills and knowledge. And then again, there's some disadvantages because CSR risks. So the business might not be operating ethically. There might be some loss of control, um, the loss of Australian jobs as well. And then also intellectual property too. And then we have supply chain management. This is really involving meeting customer demands for goods and services while making the most efficient use of inputs of input um, resources in both the production process and the distribution of the final product. So the management of a supply chain, um, supply chain is definitely something that's very complex, but it's just the link between organizations, people, activities, and resources involved in moving a product or service from suppliers to manufacturers, then finally to customers. So it's literally the story, the link of how we get from point A to point B. Um, and then most supply chains tend to be quite tend to be quite long, complicated, um, and often very global. All right, we made it through unit three. Um, so just before we go on to our break, I'm just gonna quickly run through um, a bit of promo. So we are doing a, if you want extra support with your exams, there is a year 12 exam revision pass or just 379, but within that you get access to live classes, previous recordings, online testing and resources, for basically all of your year 12 subjects. So it's definitely um, something that can support you with that. Um, but with Shoot Smart, they also offer online tutoring. So 
you know, one-to-one private tutoring call, um, private tutoring, um, which runs for an hour. Um, again, very experienced tutors. Um, but if you, if that's something that you're interested in, if you, you feel like you want some extra support um, coming up to your exams, definitely book an info call with us and we'll get you matched up with the perfect tutor. Um, yes. All right. So I'll give everyone maybe a five minute break. We are running a little bit over time, but that is fine. Um, yeah, I'll give everyone maybe a five minute break. And then in the meantime, I'll just quickly look through some questions. But yeah, I'll give everyone a five minute break. And then maybe we can answer one or two questions before we go into unit four. And then if we have more time, we'll answer more questions towards the end. Cool. Okay, I'll have a go at start. I'm going to start answering some of the questions. Um, I'll answer like two or three. I'm going to start with the top ones. But what did I average on my sex to achieve a 44 steady score? So I think, actually, it's a bit of, it's kind of fuzzy, but I think I averaged probably around um, 85 or 90 percent on my sax i think yeah if you want to get above like 40 you definitely want to be looking at averaging yeah from like 85 above um and then ultimately it's also dependent on how well you do in your exam as well um so i think i got a pluses for all of the um all of my for term for unit three unit four and also the exam um so that definitely helps as well. Okay, I'm just gonna mark that as complete. Will we lose marks if we do not define for which command words are definitions compulsory? So whenever there is a key um, 
a key term in the question I feel like it's always just good to define it even though you might even if there isn't allocated marks towards that because sometimes it's just a good way of demonstrating your knowledge and ultimately you're marked on how well you understand the content and just having a definition in there can sort of help the can sort of um from the examiner's perspective sort of show that you understand what this key term means so task words that where definition is compulsory definitely would be you know your defined questions even some of the explained questions just starting with the definition um showing that you understand this um because you can't just assume that you can't, you don't want to just include something and then not really explain it it's always wherever there's an opportunity for you to demonstrate your knowledge always um include it so i always try to if there, wherever there is a key term i always just define it just so that um it's sort of a safety net in the case where the examiner's a bit iffy around if you understand it, at least if you've included a definition, they're like, okay, um, you know, it's there. And so um, I would just I would just recommend defining um, wherever there is a key term. But I mean, for your identify or outline questions, you don't need to include a definition, definition there. Um, but with discuss, compare, distinguish, um, since you're talking about more so similarities, differences, and advantages and disadvantages, you don't need to include a definition. Okay, test for 10 markers. We're going to go through 10 markers towards the end of the lesson, so um, I will answer that towards the end of the lesson. Um, and then I'll look at one more question. So in section B of the exam, case study, do we have to refer to the case study in every question, even if it's not specified? So section B of the exam, every single question you have to link it to your case study so even though in the question it doesn't say referring to the case study um tell me how define how four drive theory can be applied uh tell, define or explain the four drive theory um you should always be linking it to the case the, the case study in section b so section b is purely the case study and so every question that you get in that part of the exam it's expected that you're linking it to that case study Um, how many past exams do you recommend to complete? There's, I cannot give you a ballpark. I can't give you like a figure because it depends on you as the individual and how you feel like, how much practice you feel like you need. Um, but it's always good to complete maybe, you know, at least 10. Um, I always say like the first two or three exams that you do, um, you know, do it open book. It doesn't have to be under strict, like, exam conditions just so that you're able to sort of remind yourself revise like the content but then after that third one you should probably begin to start doing it in um strict exam conditions so if you plan on doing five then you know the first one you know treat it as sort of like a you know you don't have to do that under strict time conditions just you know have an open book just so it's a lot less overwhelming but then after that um i would recommend that you do it under those strict conditions but um I can't give you an exact number because um it's all dependent on you and how you feel like how much support you feel like you need um but definitely um the more the better because um you want to be ensuring that you're practicing your knowledge but it's also important to remember that you shouldn't just do like five practice exams in a row or like in a day like do one practice exam get some feedback on it or you know look at the answers see where you went wrong and then take on board that feedback and you know maybe reattempt a particular question again um, so that you're not making the same mistake um, over those five practice exams. Um, hopefully that made sense. But yeah, so sort of understanding, doing a practice exam, understanding where you where you went wrong so that you're able to keep that feedback in mind the next time you attempt a practice exam, you might be you might encounter a similar question and you're like, oh okay, in the first in that first practice exam I forgot to um, link it to the case study more explicitly. And so um, just sort of keeping those things in mind. Cool. All right. I'm going to go straight into unit four, the rest of the content. Um, all right. So there's also Ed Unlimited. So I talked about Ed, Limit Ed Unlimited at the start of the lecture. Um, but yeah, this is essentially where you have online access to a huge range of study guides all in one place. Um, and so, you know, there's subject notes, there's practice questions, there's trial exams, um, and there's text guides for, you know, year 11, year 12. Um, 
And so if you use my code, and you should use my code only, um, you'll get free Ed Unlimited for 21 days, which is pretty useful since your exams are coming up. So um, definitely um, you could look at consider getting that. But if you do decide to get it, um, you can use my code, um, not anyone else's. And then there's also a bookshop bookshop offer. And so you can get 15% off if you decide, if you want to get like the hard copy books, um, just use the code 15 sep on checkout. Um, and so, and you can get 15% off if you decide to get a hard copy book um, from the website. All right, now we're going to go straight into unit four, the need for change. So the first area of study is the need for change. Change is very confronting and makes people nervous. So the way that I've structured this slide is definitely quite different. And hopefully this emphasizes my point that it might be a little bit uncomfortable because the whole the whole lecture we've had that white blue sort of slide layout and now we've suddenly just changed to the white, green and black. So definitely it's almost uncomfortable, a little bit unsettling. And so that sort of encompasses the whole idea of change is that it's definitely something that makes people a little bit fearful of. It's very com um, confronting. And so as individuals, we really get ingrained into our routines. And so it can really be challenging to accept the need for change, let alone enthusiastically and support it. Because if you're comfortable with your current situation, why would you want to change the way you're doing things? And so um, that can sort of link to the idea of you know, creating challenges in the way that people actually accept change. Um, but there's something very important to understand that change is inevitable and ongoing. And especially in a business context, nothing is going to stay the way it is forever. Things are going to change. Things are going to need to change, you know, whether that be the external environment or, you know, the internal procedures of the business, um, change is a constant. All right. Now, when it comes to business change, there's two forms of change. We have reactive change and we have proactive change. So going back to Slido, what do you guys think is reactive change? Did it time out? I have to log back in. Okay. Just think about it un um, until I get the slider back up. Yes, what is reactive change? Hopefully it works now. We can go back to that. Is reactive change unplanned change, which pressures the business, which forces the business to undergo change, or is it planned change? Give people maybe like 30 seconds to put in their answers. Okay, yes, it is unplanned change. Perfect. Good job, everyone, for getting 100% on that. So Reactive change, it's really looking at acting in response to a situation rather than actually, you know, creating or controlling it. So after something happened, after an event has occurred, the business is acting in response to that event rather than actually taking the preemptive steps beforehand um, to be prepared for the event. So reactive change is, you know, acting in response after something has happened. And so it links to the idea of unplanned change that pressures really force the business to undertake. So they haven't planned for this to happen. Um, it's all unplanned because um, pressures have forced them to undertake this particular change. Proactive, on the other hand, is the complete opposite. So this is where the business is creating or controlling a situation rather than just responding to it after it has happened. Um, and so links to the idea of plan change. It's all about plan change where the business is sort of, you know, changing or have is taking those steps beforehand before um, an event has occurred or before pressures force it to um, undergo change. So just thinking in your head, which form is more effective, which 
is the most effective form of change? Is it reactive or is it proactive? Hopefully everyone has thought of proactive. So proactive change is definitely a lot more effective because, um, you know, it's the business actually taking the initiative um, of, you know, controlling a situation or, you know, being being prepared for a particular thing. Um, whereas reactive, they're responding to it after it has happened. So maybe it might mean that, you know, they might not have the resources um, to undergo that change because it's unplanned. And so there could be some issues there. So it's always, um, proactive change is always the more effective form of change when it comes to business change. Cool. And then we have our KPIs. So these are really important for everyone to remember um, because they do come up a lot in the exam. So they tend to come up in the form of tables. So it's really important that you understand what each of the KPIs mean and also what does an increase or decrease mean for the KPIs. So for some of them, an increase of that particular KPI is good. But then on the other hand, um, for others, an increase wouldn't be so good. So for example, percentage of market share, if that increases, that's good. But if number of customer complaints increases, that's not good because that indicates that customers aren't satisfied with the business's outputs or services. So you should be able to interpret and understand what an increase or decrease in a KPI actually um, suggests. Cool. So these are our KPIs. So we have market share, we have profit, we have productivity, number of sales, absenteeism, staff turnover, wastage, number of customer complaints, and also workplace accidents. All right, a bit of an activity. So um, actually, I'll just quickly go through just briefly what each of the KPIs are. So market share um, is all about the amount of sales that a business actually owns in a particular industry. Profit is given by your revenue minus expenses, productivity growth. I kind of like to think of it like efficiency. So it's really looking at using less inputs and producing more outputs, but just being productive in the sense um, that, you know, the business being as productive as possible. Um, number of sales, literally the amount of people that are, the amount of sales that the business is getting, so the amount of people that are actually buying um, their goods or services, staff absenteeism, the amount of scheduled, the rate of skit, it's the amount of times that employees do not attend um, scheduled work. So absenteeism is looking at if a staff was rostered for a particular day, if they don't show up, then that's recorded as staff absenteeism. And then level of staff turnover. So that's the rate at which employees are leaving the business, but also need to be replaced. So really important that you include that latter part of the definition. Um, don't just stop at, you know, the amount of employees leaving the business. That's part of it. But it's also looking at how often they need to be replaced by the business. Um, and then we have level of wastage. And that's literally looking at the number of like wasted or um, underutilized or underused sort of inputs um, and sort of, materials um all of the raw materials and you know things like time um and things that the business uses to create its outputs um but sort of unused or underutilized in that aspect and the number of customer complaints these are the number of people that have approached the business to alert um them of their dissatisfaction so in your definition of number of customer complaints important to um highlight that it's actually the number of customers that actually alert the business to their dissatisfaction so if the customer doesn't alert the business um, of their dissatisfaction then it's not actually formally recorded as a customer complaint so really important that you include that and then we have number of workplace accidents so looking at you know the disruptions of workflow um, and injuries and things like that okay spot the mistakes so which one which of these definitions has a mistake is it a b or c I'll maybe put on the Slido and then I'll go back to the question. So have a read of them. Which one do you think has a mistake?
Okay, hopefully everyone has been able to have a go at that. So it is A. So looking at this part, um, what is waste? Waste is any input, whether that be money, labor, time, energy, storage, or materials that is unused or unutilized by the production process. So it's kind of linking to what I was talking about before. So in order to fix this definition, I would be saying that level of wastage refers to um, the amount of inputs, for example, materials, labor, that is unused or unutilized. So it's with the, the problem with this definition is that they've limited it just to materials, but time or um, time is not, it can also be um, wasted. And so it's not a material. And so that's why um, that definition, just the wording of materials needs to be changed to inputs. Um, yeah. All right. So just some key things to remember with your definitions of KPIs. Um, I talked about this before, but with staff turnover, make sure that you include that it's also um, the required replacement of employees. Level of wastage, we just touched on that. Um, it's not just materials. It's you're, it's important to highlight that it's unused or underutilized inputs. Customer complaints, um, you know, mentioning that it's the amount of times that the customer actually told the business that they were dissatisfied. And the number of workplace accidents, it's not just injuries, it's accidents or events um, that actually cause disruptions or interruptions to the workflow. Okay, Lewin's force field analysis theory. So looking at this, we have our driving and our restraining forces. So driving forces are all of the factors affecting a situation that are really propelling um, it in a direction that is causing or supporting the change. Whereas our restraining forces are the factors that are resisting the change, are res resisting the direction of driving forces and act to decrease them subsequently blocking the proposed change from occurring so i sort of like to think of a car the driving forces our driving forces are are our accelerator and restraining forces are our brake so in the case that you have more acceleration than brake then the car is more likely to move forward um which is the case of driving forces um whereas when you're when there's more of a brake you know the car slows down it can't move forward, change is unlikely to happen, and therefore um, it's sort of blocking that change. So restraining forces, they're sort of hindering change from occurring. Driving forces, they're really supporting and causing um, the change. And so within this theory, this proposes that situations are maintained by an equilibrium between driving forces that push change to occur and restraining forces um, that really act to hinder um, or block change from occurring. So Essentially, a situation is the way it is because of the interaction of these two forces. Um, and it's all about, you know, these driving forces versus these restraining forces. And depending on which one overpowers each other or depending on which one is more stronger, that's going to determine if change is going to happen within the business. So when your driving forces are more than your restraining forces, change is likely to happen. However, when your restraining forces are more than your driving forces, that's when a business needs to look at developing an action plan to minimize the strength of their restraining forces so that they can increase the strength of their driving forces so that change is likely to occur. Cool. And these are the driving restraining forces that we need to know under the study design. So these are the different ones, the sort of the similar ones for restraining forces. So um, both managers and employees are driving forces and restraining forces, but just make sure that you're sort of familiar with all of these um, different driving forces and restraining forces. Cool. Then we have our Porter's generic strategies. So the lower cost approach is where a business aims to gain a competitive advantage by becoming that lower cost producer in the industry. Um, and so the actual competitive advantage that they're getting is that on one hand, they could be the business is selling its price at a lower than average price um, while maintaining its profit level. So um, they're selling at lower than average price um, and so they're getting profit from there. Um, on the other hand, the business can sell at a normal price but increase its profit margins. So how might a business actually implement a lower cost approach? So remember with low cost approach, it's all about the business becoming a low cost producer in its industry. It's not selling at a low cost, it's becoming the low cost industry. So it's really looking at where are ways that they can minimize their expenses and the cost of its production. So these are all strategies to achieve that. So they could implement technology. So, you know, um, 
to be increased precision, reduce waste, waste has a cost. Um, so they're um, saving in that aspect. They could buy their materials. So change to more of a low cost supplier, a cheaper supplier might implement lean management, maybe outsource its non-core tasks because outsourcing could be a bit cheaper there. Um, also sort of offer higher volumes of standardized goods and services. So achieving sort of economies of scale, um, reducing storage costs through just in time. So um, sort of ensuring that inputs aren't wasted there. And so some advantages of low cost is that there's a strong competitive advantage in markets with really price conscious consumers. So um, this really appeals to customers in the market that are sort of looking for the best bargain. And so your businesses that use a low cost approach are definitely appealing to those kinds of customers um, because customers are more likely, the price conscious customers are more likely to actually buy from these businesses. And therefore that's gonna lead to an increase in market share because it's gonna increase sales. Um, and therefore it can also help increase profit and also business growth as well. However, with disadvantages is that there might be, there isn't that sense of customer loyalty because um, there might be multiple businesses using the low cost approach. And so as customer, as a price conscious customer, you're not just gonna go to one business, you're gonna be going to the business that gives you the best deal. So um, it might be that you might go to one business to buy one thing, but then the next time you see that the other business um, offers it at a much cheaper price and so you're going to go to that business um, and so um, they can definitely be substituted for um, the they they can easily be substituted for a competitor that offers um, lower prices also customers might associate lower prices with lower quality products so looking at the price they might think that you know it offers lower quality and therefore they might not buy um, from these kinds of businesses and then also um, with lower cost with businesses that follow the low cost approach, um, their products tend to be standardized. So they might not be um, meeting the demands of customers who want more unique or tailored made products. So that could potentially um, lose some sales um, since they aren't really appealing to those kinds of customers. And then we have the differentiation approach. And this is where a business is developing the uniqueness of its goods or service, um, using innovation and creativity to establish a competitive advantage. So the competitive advantage that they're getting is that since they're using innovation and they're being creative in the way um, that they're trying to sell its goods or service, um, they're essentially, because they're selling a unique product that consumers can't buy from anywhere else, they can charge a premium price on that product. So they can take advantage of that. Um, they can take advantage of the fact that they, the, the thing that they're selling, um, people can only buy it from them. And so they're more likely to charge a high price on that product. And so why where might some businesses sort of look to differentiate itself through its competitors so they might actually look to um use innovation so use new ideas and methods to create new and unheard of goods or services so maybe thinking of some funky ice cream flavors for example that's unlike any in the market that would be an example of a business using the differentiation approach um they might even look to get an endorsement by a celebrity or expert um build some new and attractive product features so something unlike what's there in the current market, offer maybe more um, exclusive or better, you know, warranties after sales services or loyalty cards, maybe even think about the way that they're marketing and branding themselves. So they might want to think about, you know, being a bit more unique in the way that they market themselves. And then also the actual consumers buying experience. So thinking about offering like a unique buying experience to the consumers when they, you know, set foot into the store, things like that. Cool. And then advantages is that sort of the premium price point. So since the business is the business sort of is taking advantage of the fact that they can um, that the product or good the good or service is very exclusive to them. And so um, they're going to be charging a more premium price there. Um, also strong competitive advantage in markets that appeal to brand loyal consumers, um, which can help increase the market share. So in the case of, you know, business thinking of making funky ice cream flavors, consumers might be very loyal to the business. So they're more likely to come back to the business, especially if they like those flavors, um, they're gonna keep buying from those businesses. And so keep buying from that business. Um, and so they're sort of building that brand loyalty there. And then also it's accessible for both small, unique businesses um, and also large businesses as well. So regardless of the size, they can use a differentiation approach. Cool. And then disadvantages is that 
that might not appeal to price conscious con consumers um, because you know they're unwilling to pay for that higher price and also with the differentiation approach it's easy for a product's features to be replicated and mimicked by competitors so in the short term they might be successful but as other businesses and as competitors sort of observe the actions of your business and they see that oh you know um this ice cream flavor has been very successful a lot of people have been coming to this business and are continually buying from the business then as competitors you want to also sort of implement that feedback or like sort of do a similar thing and so they might also try to come up with a similar sort of funky ice cream flavor and therefore um customers might also now go to this business um so there's no sort of um there's it's easy for competitors to sort of replicate and mimic um your good or service and so you might lose your competitive advantage all right um marking the answer so i'll give everyone maybe like two minutes have a quick read of this and in your head try to mark this answer out of four Okay, hopefully I'll give everyone maybe another minute, just have a read and just in your head or maybe note down what do you think would this answer get? Okay. Let's have a look at the answer. So mark would be around two out of four. So let's try to break it down. So the question asks you to identify and describe two driving forces that might be affecting hit big. Um, and so the student, this first part, they've said two driving forces acting upon hit big are pursuit of profit and competitors. Pursuit of profit, meaning the revenue remaining after all expenses have been paid is essential for businesses as it is profit that allows them to grow, fulfill owner and shareholder expectations and so forth. So the pursuit of profit was not explained specifically in relation to HitBig's change investment in online shopping. So the mark that they lost was the link towards the case study. So they literally just provided, I mean, they included the business's name, but that's not enough. So they just provided a definition and they explained it a little bit, but they was there was no reference to the case study. So that was a loss of mark. Um, they could you know, get that mark or improve this part of the answer by saying, in order to retain profits in a shifting market, hit big must retain sales and um, sales revenue and adapt to changing consumer preferences by investing in online shopping. So that's sort of a better way that they could link it to pursuit of profit. Um, this part of the question, it was explained better than the pursuit of profit, but it sort of shares the same problem that pursuit of profit had as well. Um, it doesn't really, this whole answer doesn't really link to or explain what a driving force actually is. So that sort of comes to my point of whenever there is a key sort of concept in the question, it's always good to just define it because um, it's it's just it just demonstrates your knowledge um, and that you understand the question and the content within the question. So it's important to include a definition of driving force um, and that it actually, you know, propels, pushes a business towards change. So um, really important to include. All right. Um, I'm just no worry of time. Um, so with this mark the answer, you can have a look at it maybe after the lecture. Um, and maybe we might come back to it if we have time towards the end. Cool. Let's look at 
unit four of study two, so implementing change. So these are all the dot, dot, all of the dot points <laughs> that come under this area of study. All right, so leadership during change management. So leadership is really important because it helps to build momentum towards successful change. And so this sort of looks at, you know, leaders building a shared vision of the successful change and, you know, really communicating that shared vision to stakeholders so that everyone's on the same page, they're working towards the same goal, um, and therefore, you know, there's that sort of support for change as well. So it's really about building that momentum so that change is more likely to be successful. So that's sort of one key role of a leader during change management. Um, also really important to reduce the resistance to change. So change is like we established before, a very sort of difficult and confronting time for a lot of people, um, and so especially employees. And so managers, for managers, it's really important that they have a high level of interpersonal skills to empathize with, understand and address the concerns of stakeholders. So if they're able to use those interpersonal skills, they're able to sort of understand the skills of, understand the concerns of their stakeholders and really work with them to support them. And if stakeholders feel concerned, feel supported, then they're less likely to feel resistance um, towards change. Cool. And then leadership is also really important to direct the business and its stakeholders towards the same goals. And so really looking at, you know, a leader is someone that all stakeholders, um, wait, leader, a leader sort of looks at ensuring that all stakeholders are really focused on successfully implementing the change um, so that, you know, everyone's aligned on the same goal, everyone's working um, to achieve the same thing. Um, and that sort of helps to increase the commitment to the change as well. So really ensuring that if everyone's um, working on successfully implementing it, then they're more likely to be very committed to it as well. All right. And then we have our strategies to respond to KPIs. So can we remember our eight management strategies to respond to KPIs? Here is it on the screen. So there's eight. So we have staff training. We have motivation. Um, we have the change of management styles, skills, increased investment in technology, and also improving quality in production and cost cutting, um, lean production techniques, redeployment of resources. So all of those eight management strategies management strategies. So you might be asked in an exam situation to, you might be presented with data, you might maybe for example, um, a certain KPI is, is decreasing and that's a bad thing. A question might ask you, how can this business implement a management strategy to respond to that KPI? Um, so yeah, so really important that you understand all of these strategies and you're able to link them to particular KPIs um, so that if you're asked about it on an exam, um, you can sort of address that. You can sort of explain your answer and address that. Um, so yeah, with staff training, pretty straightforward. So it's just when staff undergo, um, you know, additional training so that they're able to um, increase their skills and knowledge. Motivation definitely um, helps in improving productivity. So. Um, if you're linking to, you know, KPIs of market share, so maybe um, if staff motivation is used as a management strategy, you know, employees are more likely to be um, be able to work more productively. Um, therefore, they might be producing a better quality output or um, good quality good or output. Um, and so if that quality of output is increased, therefore customers are more likely to be satisfied coming back to the business, more likely to come back to the business more frequently and therefore um, that increases sales and therefore market share. Yeah, and then we have our change in management styles or management skills. So considering what management styles should be changed or um, should be used to achieve different, um, to achieve different KPIs. And the same thing sort of goes for management skills as well as increased investment in technology. Um, so maybe investing in automated production lines or sort of the different technology management strategies that we looked at in unit three. So you can use sort of those as examples. Improving quality in production. So if quality is improved, we know that output is the, the quality of output is also improved. Um, and so that helps with 
improving satisfaction and therefore reducing customer complaints potentially because customers don't have a reason to complain because they're satisfied. Um, Also cost cutting, so looking at ways where the business can reduce its expenses that can help and increase net profit figures potentially because if they're able to cost cut, for example, maybe they might downsize their workforce, they might um, change to a cheaper supplier, they might outsource all of those things um, that can help them reduce their expenses and therefore increase their revenue. Um, they might use lean production techniques. So um, I think pull through production, Judoka, zero defects, any sort of examples you can use that can help um, address the KPI of level of wastage. And then also redeployment of resources. So looking at natural labor capital. So labor, for example, um, they might redeploy employees from one area of the business, so one department of the business to another department, um, and that can maybe make employees, give employees a bit of that challenge and stimulation, but also um, they might employees might see it as a way of gaining new experiences um, and learning more things, and they might that might help increase their motivation, uh, and so they that might help address staff absenteeism or turnover because they're more likely to attend work. Um, yeah, those are some examples of things that you could probably link these to um, with the different KPIs. Cool. Now looking at the three-step change model. So we have unfreeze, movement, and also refreeze. And yes, so yeah, unfreeze, movement, refreeze. And yeah, within Lewin three-step change model, this is essentially a theory that outlines that's the steps that a business needs to take when implementing changes to its practices so that change is long lasting. So the point of this theory is really ensuring that, you know, whatever the steps that the business takes, um, it's it's really looking at ensuring that um, the change that is being implemented is successful and it is long lasting and the business will sort of see it through to the long term. All right, so looking at unfreeze. So this occurs before the change actually happens. Movement is when the change is during the change, so actually when the change is occurring. Really important with movement, don't call it like change. Um, It's just occurring during the change. Refreeze, that happens after the change. So looking at these more specifically, so with unfreeze, this is the preparation undertaken by the business prior to implementing the change to really open it up to change. Um, And so within this step, a really key part of it is looking at establishing the need for change. So this is when the manager is really going to be communicating that, okay, this, this needs to change and maybe justifying why change needs to happen, but really communicating that to stakeholders so that that need for change is actually being established. Um, And so employees are able to understand that and that might help reduce resistance um, at the forefront. Movement. Um, this is when the actual implementation of the change is occurring. So this is where the business is actually transitioning from its old practices to its new ones. So literally undergoing that change. And since it is that period of change, this tends to be the period of the most significant resistance. So this is when employees might feel a little bit, um, they might voice their concerns. They might be like, what's happening? Um, why is it happening? And there's going to be some issues. There might be some issues there Um, and so really important that management have effective strategies to deal with that resistance but also are supporting the employees um, and empathizing with employees so that um, that resistance is reduced and then refreeze so this is all about ensuring that you know that change is consolidated into the culture of the business um, so that the change is implemented into the long-term future and the business actually sees it through to the long-term. Um, and so examples of refreeze, so ways that the business might refreeze, they might celebrate, they might recognize positive employee behavior, they might um, yeah, celebrate the achievement of the change um, and see if, you know, if there's one particular employee that was working very hard during the change, you know, celebrating that, recognizing their efforts, um, that's sort of some ways that a business can sort of implement the change into the culture of the business because um, there's no point sort of going through unfreezing movement just to have the change sort of abandoned. Um, So this is a really important step to ensure that it's actually consolidated into the business. Cool. All right, CSR in change 
management. So CSR is all about the commitment by an organization to conduct its business in an ethical manner, um, which really looks at, you know, going above and beyond those legal requirements um, to minimize negative impacts on the environment, society, and the economy, as well as other stakeholders. So CSR, it's really just make sure when you're defining CSR, ensuring that you're mentioning it's a business going above and beyond its legal requirements um, to support, you know, these different stakeholders. So the environment, society, the economy, um, and other stakeholders as well. Cool. And so with CSR, when you're, when um, implementing CSR, which in change, it sort of comes into two forms. So the change itself could be socially responsible. So I will go through some examples later, but you know, if it's, if the business is actually, you know, looking at using renewables or um, changing its manufacturing methods to be more environmentally sustainable or to reduce their carbon footprint. Those are some examples of the change itself being socially responsible. But on the other hand, CSR could also, um, CSR during change could also involve um, the business sort of considering its stakeholders and how their stakeholders are being treated. So really looking at um, that stakeholders should be treated ethically throughout the change process and sort of coming up with strategies where um, the business could you know, support its stakeholders a little bit more um, throughout change because we do know that it is very, um, it's sort of a period of high stress and anxiety for stakeholders. So um, the business is sort of going above their legal requirements by, you know, providing that extra support to stakeholders to support them during that process. So when we're looking at the first one, so when we're thinking about the change itself being socially responsible, the business will want to ensure that it considers changes that, you know, limits its negative environmental impact. So what we sort of touched on before. Um, so, you know, introducing green energy, biodegradable packaging, sourcing inputs to reduce pollution, sort of those areas and aspects. Um, and also employing from the local community. So maybe investing in Australian jobs. So not using outsourcing or overseas manufacturing, but rather, you know, supporting local Australian businesses so that there's job opportunities created for um, local Australians. Um, and then with the second point or aspect of CSR during change, or another thing you could explore is where stakeholders are actually treated ethically throughout the change process. So this would involve the business really ensuring that change is not, you know, really stressful for employees or managers. Um, and then they're providing, you know, training to ensure that employees feel capable of handling change. So maybe if the business was changing the software that it used in the business, they might um, provide training so that employees feel, um, or they might give extra training to a particular employee so that they feel more capable of handling the change. So maybe there was a standard training that everyone had to go through, but then one particular employee um, still felt incompetent with the change. And so, the business might want to look at providing more additional training and support to that employee so that they feel more confident with that change. Um, yeah. And then also providing clear communication to reduce anxiety. So especially with change, it's really important to be transparent when communicating um, to employees as to what the change actually is, because if communic if the change is not actually clearly communicated to employees, when they actually undergoing the change, they might feel very overwhelmed and they might feel a lot of stress and anxiety because maybe they thought change, the change was one thing, but now actually going through it, um, you know, they didn't expect it. So a lot of it might have been unexpected to them and that could really be a cause of significant like stress and anxiety. So that's why it's really important that the business, when they are communicating the change, it's really clear and they're being very transparent as to how it's going to affect um, their employees because if they're being very transparent and clear at the forefront, then employees can sort of um, understand that and they can be prepared for it when they're actually undergoing the change. Also, it allows employees to have a reasonable, also they could um, look at ensuring that um, employees have a reasonable work-life balance throughout um, and after the period of change. So maybe offering more flexibility um, and some support in that sense. Um, 
also being honest, transparent while implementing the change, um, and also allowing time for transition services if change results in downsizing and redundancy. So transition services is basically, you know, supporting them, offering a service where the business can support, where, um, yeah, they support the business with, oh my God, where the business supports employees in finding um, another sort of role or another job um, so that they can still continue earning an income despite being redundant from that business. Cool. All right. Um, let's whiz through Senge's learning organization. So Senge's learning organization, they propose, this proposes that businesses are flexible, adaptive, and productive during periods of change. Um, and these businesses will be more successful in implementing desired changes. So it's really, again, sort of linking to the same thing as to how can a business ensure the successful implementation of change. And so Senge proposes that in order to be flexible, adaptive and productive, um, the business really needs to look at expanding the capacity and exp expertise of people so that they can really learn from each other, um, sort of linking to the idea of building a learning organization so that they can definite, therefore effectively create and innovate within the business. Cool. So... Senge argues that there's five disciplines that apply to a learning organization that ensures a business can learn. So these are the five disciplines. So we have mental models, personal mastery, building shared vision, team learning, and sort of system thinking is sort of the overarching sort of discipline. And then these are sort of like the four sub disciplines, but yeah, that's sort of how this, sort of, there's five disciplines altogether, but um, systems thinking is, they say it's like the overarching one. All right, so systems thinking is the idea of viewing and evaluating the business as a whole, complex and interrelated system, rather than really breaking it down into its disconnected areas. So rather than seeing the business as, okay, there's this department, there's this department, there's this department, um, they're seeing them as, seeing the business as sort of one whole sort of interrelated, interconnected um, system, um, and that therefore the actions of one area will have an impact on the on the way that you know another area sort of functions but um it's sort of yeah viewing the business as one whole big thing so it's a concept that integrates sort of all of the other four disciplines and so um the business must understand the holistic image of themselves only um if they're able to do that they can develop to the other four disciplines and so this is sort of like the cornerstone or of the learning organization then we have mental models. So these are the deeply ingrained, ingrained assumptions, generalizations, and images that influence one's understanding of the world and therefore how one react, actually reacts to the world as well. So it's sort of um, linking to the idea of, um, you know, the way that they think, their assumptions, their generalizations, and images, um, all of those things sort of influence how they perceive the world around them. Um, and so with understanding, you know, change in learning, should mental models be preserved or challenged, they should definitely be challenged um, because if they're preserved, you know, individuals often tend to have a limited or narrow sort of view um, and narrow-minded in the way that sort of they think about other things. So really important that they're challenged so that um, their people's perspectives are broadened. So employees should be encouraged to challenge old assumptions, old assumptions to gain empowerment and the ability to generate new and innovative ideas. So maybe that might be done through a culture of open communication, inquiry, and trust. And so this is where Senge argues that businesses really need to be able to scrutinize the actions and their current choices in order to make the best decisions and best choices in relation to change. Then we have personal mastery. So this is really looking at where an individual is committed to this idea of self-improvement and is constantly deepening their personal vision and um, you know they're learning from consistent and constant self-reflection so it's really looking at the individual doing introspect sort of assessment of themselves and looking at how they can improve um, but yeah this is acquired through training and development and self-evaluation and so personal mastery is also a, a, it's a corner step or a stepping stone to team learning so just a quote, organizations learn only through individuals who learn. Individual learning does not guarantee organizational learning, but without it, no organizational learning occurs. So um, it's sort of, yeah, that step towards team learning. So really being critical, an individual, an individual being critical of themselves, looking at ways that they can improve um, and gain mastery over them.
themselves. And then we have building a shared vision. This is um, looking at where a business is, business that has a shared vision of its future is one that is aligned all people within the business towards the same goal. So really looking at how that a business um, all the people within the business working towards the same thing, essentially. And so a shared vision will motivate employees to learn and innovate by providing that common goal goal and objective that really helps to generate that clear focus um, and understanding and enthusiasm for that learning that's going to happen. And this is also another stepping stone towards team learning. However, it's important that with the shared vision that it can't be dictated. So it can't be just set by the manager and the manager being like, okay, everyone's going to go towards like strive towards this it's really important that with shared vision it's built from both the directional prompts of a leader but also the conversation between others within the business so you know considering what other employees feel um and sort of um reaching that middle ground towards um building a shared vision of um where the business wants to go um, and what people want to achieve as well then we have team learning so this is a process by which a team's capacity to create desired results results is built and developed so looking at you know how a team can actually learn from each other learn with each other as well so looking at creating an environment where knowledge and experience is shared amongst the team members um, and therefore problem solving and learning is a lot more effective so sort of everyone tackling issues and problems together um, and so that links to the idea of collaboration and how that's sort of like a key aspect of the learning organization and so people don't just learn in isolation, they learn together. Um, so that's really important um, with this discipline. So if you are applying Senge's learning organization, these are some examples you can use. So with mentor models, employees could be encouraged to challenge models through Kaizen. So continuous improvement or with personal mastery, you know, having those performance appraisals, self-evaluation training so that an individual can see what are their areas of improvement and sort of strive towards um bettering themselves building a shared vision so looking at feedback from employees about the goals the visions um some clear communication about you know from leaders about what the about business goals and then team learning you know collaboration collaborative tasks group projects regular team meetings and then systems thinking sort of looking at meetings between the business departments um, and also employees maybe you know taking up positions in different departments to broaden their views and see how you know um, how departments often rely on each other and they don't just operate in isolation. All right, so we've done all of unit four and unit three. Now we're going to look at some important exam knowledge. So we're going to go through these four aspects. So time management, task words, um, interpreting, marking, allocations, exam preparation, and 10 mark questions. So I'll try to go through them um, quickly so that we have some time at the end to answer some questions because um, I'm seeing quite a few questions in the Slido. So I do want to have some time to answer them, um, answer the questions that you guys have. All right, so 10 mark questions. Um, this was the 2018 10 mark question. So how, have a think and how might have you, how might, would, how would you answer this question if you were 28? 2018 students so you know think about the task words and the key words in the question so give everyone like a minute just to have a look at it and just thinking about the task words and maybe like think about what would you sort of mention and what how would you sort of go about answering the question All right, hopefully everyone has been able to at least read the question um, and we come up with a bit of a plan. But how did the state go with answering this question? So average was 3.3 marks. So a lot of people got below five, so around the zero to five range. So you can see a lot of people actually didn't attempt the 10 mark question. I would definitely recommend with the 10 mark question, have a go at it, have a, at least try to attempt it because you never know 
you could you most definitely will able to you most definitely will be able to get you know a few marks from that so don't just leave it blank I know it seems a little bit overwhelming when you first read the question there's so many parts of the question um, but just try to break it down plan it out a little bit um, but do give it a go because it's likely that you can get some marks for it even if you just mention some definitions just show your understanding for some content um, but don't just leave it blank which the majority of people, I think, tended to do. Um, but yeah, do have a go at it, um, since you could get some marks there. But some common mistakes for this question is that a lot of students just gave definitions of corporate culture that were not necessary. Um, and some students used contemporary case studies to flesh out their answers, but sort of got distracted um, and then sort of focused too much on the case study rather than answering the question itself. And then also some students refer to a legal obligation um, rather than CSR because CSR issues is all about going above and beyond, remember, um, not what the what is legally required of people. Um, looking at the different areas of management responsibility, so there's sort of these five aspects. Um, students had to select two of these areas and for each analyze the corporate social responsibility considerations that influence the decisions made by the managers. So the word, the task word analyze requires quite a lot of like critical thinking and explanation. So particularly because this question had less content to cover compared to the previous 10 mark question. So it's really important with that question that you are really fleshing out your answer um, as part of that analyze task word. So this is part of the sample response. I'm not going to go through it. Um, so you guys can maybe have a go through it maybe after the lecture, just read through the sample response, but you can even find this on the 2018 examiner's report. Um, but just noting that, you know, something that they've done really well is that they've clearly outlined um, and identified the area of management responsibility. They've explained um, very well the way that CSR can influence the HR manager's decisions. Um, and then also provided that other link as to how CSR could influence the HR manager's decisions and then they've also been quite complex and analytical um, and displayed that sort of analytical thinking. So that's sort of like a good breakdown as to how um, it's been structured, but it should be clear in your answer, like um, what you're talking about. So that's what um, I would recommend is that when you're structuring your sentences, like the way that they've said, another way, another area of management responsibility is HR. They haven't just said um, HR involves that, da, 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 da. They've said that they've labeled that as a management responsibility. So it's clear that they're addressing another manage area of management responsibility. And then they're going on to um, talk about the definition. And then even then they've said one way a business may be CSR conscious through HR is by X, Y, and Z. So now it's clear that, okay, now the student is linking to how CSR can be implemented in the decisions of the HR manager, um, which they've sort of outlined. So when you when you are writing your answer, it's always just clear. It's always good to just be clear in what you're um, saying. So that's what this answer has done very well. And then to answer the questions of how many practice exams should I do, which I think I looked at and I uh, um, answered before, but really it's good to do as many as you can. But the recommendation is around at least 10 with five or so under those time conditions. But practice exams ultimately are your best form of study. Um, there's no set number, but you should really be aiming to do the, the amount of practice that um, you have to do in order to achieve, in order to gain that confidence in your knowledge. Um, but also important to think about, like, even if you're not just doing practice exams, but just looking through the practice exams and looking at the questions that you find hard and maybe attempting the questions that you find hard, because it's important that you're addressing your areas of weakness um, and not just focusing on the areas where you're very strong in because um, if in the case that you know you didn't understand real versus official corporate culture but then in the exam that question comes up you're going to be a little bit clueless because you didn't practice that um, part because you you know you were only focusing on your strength so it's really important that you're addressing your areas of improvement as well um, yes so then with practice exams ultimate form of preparation is practice questions and practice exams. So when you do a practice exam, really important to um, complete the exam 
without notes preferable. I think the first two exams, it's fine to have your notes with you, um, but then after that, you should really be looking at doing it under timed conditions. Um, and then you can mark your answers, so getting some feedback from your teacher or maybe looking at the sample guide, actually noting and annotating your responses would be good. That's something that I did um, and I found very helpful um, because I think, I feel like when you're marking things yourself, you're able to really understand, you know, I think, yeah, you're able to really understand what you can um, do to improve. Um, so that's always a good way to go about it. And then also good to highlight just maybe highlight the questions which you struggled with um, the most. So maybe when you were completing your practice exam, you could just maybe put a star um, and just just to indicate that, you know, this was a question that you struggled with um, and you might want to revise that after. Also good to revise your notes of those areas um, and then maybe reattempt the question as well. So once you've actually marked your question, um, put the feedback through or um, once your teacher has given you some feedback, always good to just reattempt the question so that you're able to um, practice um, and implement that feedback into your work. All right, so the exam preparation timetable. So the month before, which we kind of are in right now, it, you should be looking at revising your notes from all of the areas of study. So focusing on your weak areas, doing some practice practice exams. So this is when you don't have to do them under time conditions until unless you feel super, super confident or you've, you know, you've started preparing since July. But um, yeah, this is the first, this is sort of the area where you don't have to like do the time practice exams, um, time, yeah, time practice exams um, the month before. But once the weeks before, so once you've, um, when you're entering those like three weeks or three weeks into, three weeks before your exam, that's when you should be looking at doing some more time practice practice um, and also looking at identified identifying and developing um, and addressing your weak areas as identified in your practice exam performance so actually going through your practice exam identifying okay I struggled with um, quality control or quality management strategies or Senge's learning organization I need to revise that so addressing those areas and making sure you're actually taking the steps to revise that that's really important and then the night before, really important to have a good night's sleep. So don't be up until 2 a.m. revising the whole year's worth of content. It's really important that, you know, you are giving yourself good sleep so that you're not sleep de deprived when completing the exam. Um, but also you're giving your brain a bit, you're going, you're entering into the exam with a fresh brain and therefore you're more likely to remember things. Um, if you cram everything the night before, it's likely your brain's going to be super tired and you won't be able to like remember or um, it just won't, it, it, it might not be the most effective that it could be. Um, so it's really important to give it proper rest. Um, but even, even then, the night before, um, as long as you've done that consistent practice, you really have nothing to worry about. Um, so you should be going to the exam um, pretty confident, you know. Um, hopefully you have that reassurance that you've done the best that you could, you could have done. Um, and so that's... So hopefully that will keep you going and that will give you some sense of reassurance. But um, that sort of highlights the importance of being consistent with your exam preparation. You don't want to leave everything the week before. So really do try to um, break things up, come up with like a little exam revision timetable um, so that, you know, you can do things consistently and you're not leaving everything the week before. Because even if you do like, you know, 30 minutes or an hour of Bizman revision every day, um, that definitely does add up. Um, when it comes to the night before the exam. So don't study too hard before the exam, the night before the exam. Um, so just be relaxed, maybe revise, do some brief revision, um, but nothing too full on. And then the day of the exam, so no intense study, just revising some notes if you'd like to, um, maybe going through some flashcards or some mind maps, um, but really important to eat and drink well. So have a good breakfast um, and be well hydrated too. So some study tips. So the first and unfortunately most unhelpful tip is that absolutely everyone is different and therefore um, different things work for you. But there's some pretty common study tips. So you can use some flashcards, one page summaries, you know, explain something to your family, explain a particular area um, of study to your family or content to your study uh, to your family, um, do some time practice exams, reading examiner's report. That's very helpful. So looking at what students tend to get wrong um, and understanding that and then um, sort of keeping that in mind when you are answering similar questions. 
and then even using your teachers so asking them questions asking them for feedback they are very helpful as well um and even mind maps I use mind maps just to summarize like areas of study I think that was a really good revision tool because I didn't have to like go through my pages of um my pages worth of revision notes it was all just there on one sort of page summarizing everything so that might be helpful and useful for you too too all right yes that is all that is it um we've finished all of year 12 business management so good job everyone um but do make sure that you use you know the study design as your guide so looking at the key knowledge key skills um nothing if it's not on the study design if it's not on the key knowledge or if it's not on the key skills it won't be on the exam so only study what's on the study design um so that's why it's really important to check between what you've learned in class and what's on the study design because maybe the teachers taught you something else um so don't spend time revising that because that won't be on um unless it's not on the key knowledge or on the study design then it's um not going to be tested on use the re examiner's report um and then you know, make sure you're doing the practice questions, identifying the areas that you struggle with, um, and studying those areas as well. Cool. Let's go through some questions because I know that there is quite a few questions. So we have, we want some tips for 10 mark questions. With 10 markers, I would definitely recommend highlighting the key task words, highlight the key content, but also spending a few minutes doing a plan. 10 mark questions are very, like, the, it's basically like an essay. You should treat it like an essay. You should be having an introduction um, and then briefly sort of you know the way you want to structure continue your um continue your answer but yeah definitely write in paragraphs as well um with 10 mark questions and even with other questions as well um I would definitely recommend writing in paragraphs because it's sort of easier to um it's easier to look at um for the examiner and they tend to like people who um write in paragraphs but yeah for 10 markers definitely do a plan just on the side of the page so that you understand what you're going to talk about um in your answer and also, yeah, make sure that there's some sort of like introduction and also some sort of like conclusion um, because with the 10 mark questions, there's no like definitive marking allocations. It's sort of just dependent on how the examiner feels the quality of your answer is. So um, yeah, definitely do a plan. Definitely try to, um, yeah, understand what you're going to talk about in each of the sections of your 10 mark question. Hopefully that helped. Should we prioritize learning definitions or the content? I think understanding the content is really important. And I think if you're able to understand the content, then you will not have to memorize definitions word for word. I think, yeah, understanding things is important than memorizing things. So if you're able to memorize, if you're able to understand the content, then you will not need to memorize the definitions, if that makes sense. Do you have any tips for preparation the night before the exam? Do not cram. Do not leave it to last minute. Um, make sure that you get a good night's sleep um, and make sure that you are, um, yeah, you get a good night's sleep. You're not sleep deprived or anything. Um, and don't do like five practice exams the night before. So just get some good rest, work consistently um, and just calm the nerves because I know it can be a little bit daunting for some people, but just know that you've done a lot of hard work throughout the year and so it will be completely fine. Do you recommend knowing the different types of planning skills, strategic, tactical, operational? Um, I was not taught that and it's not in the study design so I do not think that you will need to know that um, since it's not, since the study design doesn't want you to know the different types of planning skills. Is there any AOS area studies that usually appears more than others in the exam? Um, I think you can't say because every year it is different, so it could be quite different. But just know that um, anything within the um, study design can be tested on. Um, area study one doesn't tend to be a significant focus within the exam, um, but like it's hard to say because every year it can be different. So um, there's no sort of structure there. All right, so what studied exams or tips would you recommend leading up to the exam? Kind of went through some of those. How many real life business exam, business case studies do we have to know um, by heart before entering an exam? Um, I mean, you should know like two. I think for me, I studied Yakult and Common North Bank for unit three area study three. Um, 
but just have a few that you can sort of apply to the different area of studies, um, but have at least one case study for each of the area of studies, I would say. Um, what percentage of profits must be, re must a business reinvest? 100%. So they should, all of their profits are directed towards a community um, cause. Um, in this site design, do we need to know? So you need to know the entitlements that they get under terminate upon termination. Um, so yes, because they, if you're talking about accrued long service leave as an entitlement, you would have to mention that this is only they're only entitled to that if they've worked longer than seven years. Um, okay, maybe like two more questions. Do you recommend doing more practice timed questions for each key knowledge point or just whole practice exams? Um, it, 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 it's honestly up to you how you want to do it. But um, I mean, you could get like a practice question for official versus real corporate culture, put like a timer on for like three minutes, depending on how many marks it is. And then try and time yourself there. Um, maybe it's like one day you might not have the time to do a whole practice exam. So you might choose to pick, you might pick out like four questions and you might put like a timer for like 30 minutes and try to do it in that set time. So it's up to you how you want to do it. I don't think it makes a significant difference, but as long as you are do it, you've done considerable like practice with time conditions, um, that's important. All right. I'm going to close off and end the lecture there. I hope everyone found it very useful. It was lovely um, taking the lecture, um, but I hope I wish you all the best of luck for the exam. I'm sure everyone will do amazing, um, but do make sure that you're revising and you're consistent. But um, yeah, all the very best and I'll see you all next time. Thanks, guys.